So a common question is EMDR sounds a bit weird, but how does it work? The first thing that I would say would be that EMDR, because it had the eye movement aspect of it, um, really has always you know, warranted that question. It seems a bit weird and people don't really understand how it works. So I think the first thing to do is to sort of, for the average therapist, just understand a bit about the brain and how the brain is structured. Paul McLean developed a model called the tri-brain model, which is a very simplistic model of understanding the brain. Um, we recognize that it's, it's overly simplistic, but it's still so useful we continue to use it. So I think if we use that here, uh, and the simplest thing to think of is your hand. So if we have the, the wrist and uh, forearm here, that represents our spinal cord and our reptilian brain. The base of our thumb and our thumb represents the emotional or limbic brain and our fingers represent the neocortex, the sort of newest part of the brain as it were. Now, we can think of information traveling from the ground floor to the top floor, from the reptilian to the limbic emotional brain and then up to the neocortex. But we must also remember that the brain then has two halves. It has a right half and a left half. So if we first of all think of information that normally, you know, what's the normal journey that information takes? Well, it comes into the reptilian brain and then it meets then a structure um, called the thalamus, which gets information all lined up. And then that information passes through an alarm and alert system. Is there anything dangerous we need to be aware of? And if there's no danger there, it goes up the limbic brain where it gets emotionality fear, anger, sadness, joy, and then relays up to the neocortex. And the thalamus is at the junction just at the wrist here, and this is also where the information passes from the right-hand side of the brain to the left-hand side, and actually then back again. So information, if we think of a, a metaphor for that journey through the brain structures, we can think of a journey through an airport. So when you come into the airport, you checked your bag in and you then come to the security system so the first thing you meet is the security guards so that's like your thalamus they're going to get you into a line and they're going to get all the information lined up ready to pass through the alarm and alert system so that's the scanner and the scanner is the amygdala which is deciding if there's danger or no danger once it goes through that you're through into duty free so that's like a bit of retail therapy, it's the emotional part of the airport, a bit of fun, you enjoy doing stuff. Maybe make your way to the airport lounge, have a gin and tonic or, or two. But then after that, you're moving then ultimately to the plane where you're going to make your journey. And that journey is the whole intention of being in the airport. So that's like a normal flow of information. And you're also moving from the outside world to the airside world but then back again. Now, this is like the journey between the right and the left hemispheres. Um, Ian McGilchrist has what he calls the split brain theory. And it's not the old lateralization model where the left brain is logical and the right brain is creative. That model isn't accurate. But when we look at what Ian talks about, that we have two different perspectives on the world. The right hemisphere has a wide attention of the world around us. Um, he uses the example of a bird landing on the ground, picking out seeds from amongst gravel. That narrow focused attention is the focused attention that the left hemisphere has. It breaks things down into parts and things are represented there. It's where we pick the words for language to put a narrative in a story. So left brain is narrow focused attention. Whereas the right hemisphere is where presencing occurs. It's where we are being in the here and now. We're right here, right now, presencing, being present. And that's a right hemisphere activity. So whenever the brain is communicating, that information comes up, it gets an emotional label. It's linking in with learning and older learning. And it's then moving from the wide sense of being in the world, but which is relatively wordless, it's broken down and we get a narrative which is left hemisphere, but narrow focused attention, but a re-presentation of the world, but then we want that to go back again. So the flow of information should be happening in that nice two-directional way 
um, and we get functional learning occurring in that way. What trauma does, it's like the alarm goes off. Now, if the alarm goes off in the airport, what happens? The security guards say, right, you're not going any further. That's exactly what happens in the brain. And so information doesn't make its journey. We sometimes can't get the words or the language for emotions uh, or how we feel about that thing. And we, um, Peter Silfenios in his research describes that as alexithymia. And so the alexithymia just means that those parts of the brain aren't communicating properly. So what we see in EMDR is that EMDR is helping both parts of the brain to communicate with one another. And what you've got to bear in mind is that the role of each hemisphere is to inhibit the other. So the right hemisphere is inhibiting the left. So we don't become too rigid, too firmly focused on what we believe. But that's what can happen in trauma. Because in trauma, from a road traffic collision, my belief, my enduring belief at that time, maybe I'm going to die. But that's a problem if I'm left with that now and I'm walking around or I'm sitting with you here and I'm left with the feeling and thought, I am going to die. But because the right hemisphere hasn't been active enough and isn't integrated enough, the person can't change that opinion and they're a bit stuck. And so EMDR helps to bring those two parts, two functions together and allows for balance to occur where the person then can go, I realize that event is over. I'm not gonna die right now. And then that changes how they interface with the world. So right hemisphere, left hemisphere perspectives on how the brain deals with trauma is something which EMDR helps move from a fragmented, um, disorganized, unbalanced system into an organized, balanced system. And a theory that we believe explains this I've proposed is called stochastic resonance. Now stochastic resonance really just means helpful randomness. So the eye movements or the tapping introduces a helpful randomness. And we know that this uh, is found in other biological systems, um, first identified in um, crayfish tails and also in ca uh, cat retinas. So we know it's something that biologically exists. And the simplest analogy is the analogy of a coffee shop. If you and I were in a coffee shop and we wanted to have a very private, intimate conversation, if we imagine everybody in the coffee shop sitting in silence, that is like the brain and trauma. We don't want to talk now. Everybody's going to hear us. Everybody's going to listen to us. So it stops communication. And that's like a traumatized brain. Communication is stopped. It doesn't want to take place. And not a lot gets happening in a functional way. However, if we go to a normal coffee shop, there's lots of background noise. It's the helpful randomness of the BLS. And so what we get instead now is, I'm happier to talk to you because everybody else is clearly having their own conversation. So the background helpful randomness facilitates communication. And the other thing is because I'm deaf, I have to concentrate on what you're saying. and I have to be focused on you speaking and that's the other thing that the BLS does. It gives focused attention on what is important, ignoring what's unimportant. And so this is the mechanism that we see at play in an EMDR reprocessing session. Increased focused uh, attention and increased communication, which allows the brain to restore balance.